stand with me for the reading of God's word. But I'm going to keep you standing for just an extra couple seconds because tonight, in one way or another, I'm going to let the Sunday school pick what we're going to talk about. Kids, and this is a challenge for the kids, a very easy question, and you can answer it, answer it in many different ways. Who can tell me, and there's not too many kids here tonight, so there's no competition, and just about any answer will get you a prize. Um, who can tell me an animal that is mentioned in the Bible? An extra credit if you can tell me the story that it's mentioned in. Annabelle. A donkey. Extra credit. What story is a donkey mentioned in? You get triple extra credit. You mentioned many stories. Very good. Come up here and get your prize. Purple, red, or green, or black? What color? What color? All right, and these are what would Jesus do bracelets. You wear it, and you think to yourself when you're, when you're happy, when you're sad, when you're angry. You look, you read WWJD. What would Jesus do in this scenario? All right, who else? I want two more animals. Uh, Eddie and then Tyler, since I saw you guys, and you guys are matching clothes. Eddie, what's an animal in the Bible? A horse. And tell me a story where a horse is mentioned, if you can. If not, it's fine. There was probably a horse in there. Very good. Come get your, come get your prize. There you go. Very good. Tyler. Tyler, I, I said that I would let the Sunday school pick the topic, but I typed up two pages on a topic, so I'm going to help you get to the topic I'm getting to. I'm thinking of an animal. And this animal... Samson found this animal on the side of the road and took honey out of its body. And this animal, David, when he was protecting his sheep, this animal would come and try to take the sheep and he would fight it. A lion, very good. Come get your prize. Yep, great job. Great job, you guys. A lion. Wow, the Sunday school picked the topic for tonight. <laughs> Would you look at that? Tonight I want to talk about two lions in the Bible. And this is a great lesson for the Sunday school kids because I made it simple for you to understand. It's a great lesson for everyone else because it's a very important message. Now I say that every time, but I think this one's important too. We'll put it that way. So open with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to read about the first lion tonight. Just one verse for now. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. I'm going to start with verse 6, actually. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. But be sober-minded and be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour Amen. You may be seated. Like I said, tonight I want to talk about two lions in the Bible, two lions mentioned in the Bible. And this is the first one, the lion we read about in 1 Peter chapter 5. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, adversary kids meaning enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. And there are three things I want us to learn about this lion tonight. And the first thing I want us to learn, I want us to focus on the word, your adversary, the, Darryl, the, the, the devil, is prowling, it says in my translation. Now what does prowling mean? The King James Version explains it a little bit simpler. Walks about. If you ever watched Animal Kingdom, a lion isn't found in the jungle, it's not, found in, it's not always found in the mountains, it's found in the, in the plains, in the prairies of Africa, where they can hide in those tall, in that brush, right, in the bush. 
That's, and you, you've seen the little um, cartoons and you've seen the scenes where a lion is, is prowling, it's, you can see its shoulder blades moving, it's, it's creeping about. And the first lion that we, we're talking about today in 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter describes it, the devil as a roaring lion prowling about, not marching like you would see an ostrich. I've been to Africa three years ago. These ostriches march across the road. They don't, they're not scared of anyone. Elephants even, they march together as a, a, a pack because they, they need to find their water hole. It's not that big of a deal to them. But a lion who's looking for his prey, I've never seen a lion in Africa even though they are there. Why? Because a lion is prowling, it's hiding, it's, it's going through the grass, prowling. And why does Peter compare the devil to a lion in this way? Why? Because the devil is actively prowling and trying to tempt you to fall into temptation. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 21, so I found it, and underline this word, I find it a law. A law means every single time, no exception, or very rarely that there's an exception. A law, a rule, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. The devil is prowling. You don't see it, just like I didn't see it on the, ro on the roads in Africa, but it's there, prowling, close at hand to make you fall. I don't have it written down, but even in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, um, the Lord tells Cain after he's murdered his brother, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Like me on a hot summer day, terrified to go out on the porch because there's a snake somewhere in there. I know there is. The same way, when you do wrong, sin is crouching at your door. The devil is prowling. Brother Johnny spoke, I think, two or three weeks ago about an attribute of the devil, and that is his shamelessness. The devil is not ashamed in any way in approaching children of God. The devil wasn't even ashamed to tempt Jesus. It says in Matthew 4, Jesus went up into the wilderness, and the very same verse, and the devil, the prowling lion, the shameless tempter, came there, it says, came there to tempt even Jesus, the Son of God. And who's to say that this tempter, this prowling tempter, is not prowling today, and I don't just mean in America, but in North Carolina, in Charlotte, in our schools, at our jobs, we can already see it in society. You don't have to watch the news very much to know what happened with the Supreme Court the last couple days. And there are people angry and up in arms and furious and even taking time out of their day to protest in the streets that they cannot sacrifice their children. Because what, what's abortion if not sacrifice? We see it in, today in the perversion that's on our phones, on social media, on TV. And we see it today and I, th I thought of this the last couple of days. We see it today through what's called the mental health crisis in America. Now, a mental health crisis, namely mental illness, like mental illness that's anatomical because there's um, incorrect wiring in your brain, essentially, that exists. But then there's also widespread in our schools and in, in our jobs, depression and anxiety, right? And we can, we can kind of expect if you live without God, if you live without a hope, the devil will come tempt you. But I've seen it that youth leaders in America lead entire seminars on mental health for their youth in the church. Now, if we believe that we were bought with a price, like Joel said, if we believe that all things work together for those who love God, if we believe that we are loved by God, the, John 14 says, if you, if you do my commands, you love the Father, and whom the Father loves, I love. Then there should not be a mental health crisis in the church. But this is how the devil is prowling in our society, and he's not ashamed to not reach into the church. Our problem today is not liberalism, it's not progressivism, it's sin. And the sooner we view the world through a lens of sin and departure from God, the sooner we'll realize when we see the devil come to attack ourselves with temptation. That's the first thing that we learn about this, about the devil. Be sober, mind, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. And then the second thing we learn 
is the second half of the verse, seeking for someone to devour. If you watch Animal Planet, I'll go back to Animal Planet, you see the lion prowling. You see him in the grass. That makes sense, right? Have you ever caught, and I, I like to watch, look these up on YouTube, caught videos of a lion actually attacking an antelope, actually attacking a water buffalo? Maybe some of you have seen it. Those of you who have seen it, think to yourselves. Have you ever seen that lion take a bite of the tail and then run? Have you ever seen that lion take a, a chomp of flank steak and then leave? Or Prince Pofta, that's enough? No. A lion is known to be the king, I call it the king of the jungle, doesn't live in the jungle, the king of the animal kingdom because it devours. It, it, it leaves just a little skeleton that you see in the cartoons. It's got blood all over its face. It eats everything. And the Bible says the devil is just like that. Like a lion seeking for whom to devour. You see, the devil's not tempting you to make you slip. The devil's not tempting you to just discourage you, just to take a little nibble of your flank steak, not to some pastors, a well-known pastor in America, and I won't name him, not to make you make little mistakes. The devil is looking to destroy you through sin. We learn in Romans that the wages of sin is death. And James, that our desire leads to sin, and sin gives birth to death. And the devil knows that just as well as we do. So the devil is not tempting you just to make you slip, just to make you fall, just to discourage you, kind of make you depart a little bit. The devil is tempting to devour, to destroy you through sin. And that is why it is so important to fight temptation. And I want to talk a little bit about what I think will be the greatest temptation. Because this is what we have to be ready for. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And I didn't read the next verse because I wanted to be there to be suspense. Verse 9, resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. The devil is prowling everywhere in society. And the devil looks to devour. And we see this because one of the greatest temptations of our faith God help us, may one day be suffering the same way the first church was suffering that Peter was writing to. Jesus references this himself in Matthew 24, verse 9 and 10. Jesus says in the end times, people will fall away because of persecution. Our faith needs to be strong enough to fight current temptations, the little things, an app you shouldn't look at, a website you shouldn't look at, a word you shouldn't say to your brother. But our temptation also needs to be big enough to fight the greatest temptation of all, which is to deny Christ, to deny our faith, to be safe. The devil is a dangerous being. The devil is prowling, always looking to tempt. Doesn't take a day off. Doesn't take a lunch break. Even Jesus himself was tempted by the devil. And the devil is ultimate looking to devour. Not to make us slip, not to, not to, you know what I mean. Not to make us these little sins that we think have no consequence. The devil is looking to devour, to destroy through sin. But there's one more thing I want us to learn about this lion tonight. And I'm going to read the verse, but a little bit more slowly this time with an emphasis on a certain word. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion. You see, at the end of the day, at the core identity of the devil is always fraud, is always a falsehood. The devil will always bring you a fraudulent hope, a fraudulent pleasure, a fraudulent peace, a fraudulent happiness. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 says, even the devil disguises himself as an angel of light. And in John 8, Jesus says of the devil that there is no truth in him and he is the king of lies. At his core, the devil is not a lion, 
is like a lion. So I may have misled you a little bit by saying we talk about two lions tonight. First Peter says the devil tries to show action, tries to show authority, tries to show power like a lion. But we know from Job that the, the, Satan had to ask for permission to tempt Job. And who can tell me, here's a, I asked a question to the Sunday school, now I got a question for the youth, since we had Bible trivia this week. Who can tell me, and it's not good to count someone's sins, but for the sake of the sermon, who can tell me, aside from the issue with Bathsheba, what is another recorded way in which, in which David sinned against God? Took a census and counted the men, counted the army. And it says that God allowed, in order to punish Israel, God allowed Satan to tempt David. At his core, Satan has no power. Satan is a fraud. At his core, he is like a lion. And he tries to show authority and he tries to show power like a lion. But there is good news. And it's the good news of the second lion. The Bible talks about a true, powerful, and authoritative lion. And it's not the devil. And I want us to open to Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Chapter 49. Verse 9 and 10. This lion is prophesied in Genesis when Jacob is blessing each of his sons. Now, he doesn't call his firstborn son a lion. That's Reuben. He doesn't call Simeon and Levi lions, even though they're second and third born. He goes to the fourth. It says, Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down as a lion and a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of all the people. So here in Genesis chapter 49, we read of a lion, a lion's cub, a lioness, who has the scepter, the rule, at his feet. This is the first time a lion of Judah is mentioned in the Bible, and it's only mentioned one other time in the Bible. The first time is mentioned in the first book of the Bible. I love this. I geek out over stuff like this. And the second time it's mentioned is in the last book of the Bible. Two bookends on the Bible. And I want us to read and focus tonight on, or finish tonight on, the second passage. And that's found in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, I'm going, to be getting, I'm going to start with verse 1. We know, kids, we know what Revelation is about, right? It's a vision that John saw of heaven. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Hmm. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I don't know what was written on that scroll, but it says, John says, And I began to weep loudly. Who knows what was written on that scroll that caused him to weep? Because nobody was found worthy to open the scroll or to look inside of it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scrolls and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders, I saw the lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the th throne. And then... Revelation 5 and 6 continues with the opening of the scroll. Now we read here a scene in heaven, a throne, a scroll written on both sides, seven seals. And a little bit more is told about the seals in Revelation chapter 6. A line of Judah that comes and is the only one worthy to open the scroll. Now if you're anything like me, you ask yourself, well, what does all of this mean? What is this scroll? What are the seals? seems important. And I'll give you the answer tonight. What do these mean? We don't really know. But it's okay that we don't really know for two reasons. We don't know what the scroll means. We don't know what the writing is. And there's, there's ideas, but I'm not that 
in theologically and intellectual to um, study that. But I know for a fact from reading the Bible that we don't know what it is. But it's okay for two reasons. First reason is Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong to us that we may do all of the works of this law. What God found important for us to obey his law, he gave us. And the second reason is because tonight's topic is not scrolls, it's not seals, it's the line of Judah. And we read here about the line of Judah that he is worthy to open this scroll. Now why? Is this line of Judah worthy to open the scroll? And then we see later, worthy to receive praise. And that's what I want to focus on tonight for this conclusion, because that's what's important to the church today. Let's read from chapter 5, a little bit further down, verse 9 and 10. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you, the line of Judah, to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. This line of Judah is worthy. This line of Judah is worthy to open the scroll, whatever it says on it. The line of Judah is worthy to receive all of our praise because he was slain for us. He was slain for our transgressions. There's a devil out there prowling around like a lion, trying to tempt you, trying to devour you through sin, trying to tell you that you are not worthy of life, trying to tell you that you are not enough, trying to tell you that you are weak to fight temptation and that you have a false hope. But there's a true, more powerful lion that was slain as a lamb, that was pierced for our transgressions and that has brought us from death to life. Glory be his name. There's a lion of Judah who, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, knew no sin, but became sin, so that we might become righteousness to God. There's a line of Judah that says in Romans chapter 3, was put forth by God as a propitiation, as a payment for our sins. There's a line of Judah who, according to John 1, is the Lamb of God who is given for the sins of the world. There's a line of Judah who, according to John 3, Said, told Nicodemus on a rooftop one night that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Glory to be his name. We learn tonight of a terrible, sinful Satan who's prowling around looking to snatch and destroy the faithful, looking to push us off the narrow road that leads to eternal life and to Jesus, looking to shake our faith to shake our homes, to shake our churches. But Bethany Romanian Church, I want to bless you and encourage you, and I'm excited about this, about 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. As for those temptations and trials and persecutions that we talked about, about that suffering, Jesus says in John 16, verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I, the line of Judah, have overcome the world. If you please stand with me and let's go with a prayer of praise before God, praising the name of Jesus. Revelation chapter 5, the very end, verse 13 says, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, every single creature, every single lion, every giraffe, every whale, every plankton, every ant is going to say these words and I want us to pray this tonight. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Let us pray.